What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another video. And today is very special because I'm going to be sitting here talking to Matthew Bauer, the director, writer, and producer of a brand new documentary that actually came out in limited release today in theaters as well as on VOD. And uh, that movie is called The Other Fellow. Matthew, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, we had our uh, California premiere last night, uh, and then the film came out on streaming about seven hours ago. So yeah, yeah, it's good. It's all happening. Nice, man. Nice. Well, uh, I gotta gotta ask you right at the jump. That one of the questions I love asking people when it comes to uh, filmmaking is, what inspired you to get started in filmmaking? Uh, this is your first theatrical feature length film, if I if I'm correct. And uh, I just gotta know what, what what started you on the path. Yeah, I was, I grew up kind of in a town in Australia uh, and I was always, you know, the film kid and it was always like James Bond for me was a really big, mo you know, you grew up on Disney and those kids films, you, you know, and then I think the jump to like the James Bond films when I was like nine years old was like a big step. Um, and that got me into, I guess, a kind of, you know, that kind of glossy, international action cinema genre you might kind of say and then specifically the usual suspects was a really big turning point for me it was the first film that that, that it, it fucked me you know what i mean like it, it just <laughs> it, it just as it as like an 11 year old kid I, I was there and when the kaiser soze reveal happens at the end you know i say it, it made me lean forward in my chair and go like oh my god you know, and kind of that, that was a big moment for me and it kind of very much got me into the kind of twisty thriller genre, um, you know, and kind of into like Hitchcock films um, and, you know, especially kind of M. Night Shyamalan films. Um, yeah, that, that sort of thing. And anyway, I, I, I kind of got into filmmaking in high school. Um, you know, my, my high school had you know, like editing equipment, you know, where you, you'd cut on, on like not reel to reel, but like VHS tape to VHS tape. Right. Uh, then moving digital, and I kind of made kind of like seven or so short films while I was at high school. Um, and then, of course, I decided to go to law school for university and that kind of move when, you know, all your friends are doing medicine and that kind of thing. And I, I, I went, I'll be an entertainment lawyer. Um, and then after a year of law school, quit that and decided to go to film school, um, NYU, like the kind of American film program, um, which is pretty well regarded, decided to open up an international school on the other side of the world. And it was called Tish Asia. And it was like NYU film school transplanted to the other side of the world. Um, and I was part of their first class there. Um, and it was kind of half Americans, then half someone from kind of, you know, most other countries around the world. Um, yeah. And, and that was a really cool education. I met a lot of cool people, um, and definitely put one foot of mine in the States somewhat. Um, yeah. And after that, I was kind of looking around for my first feature project, um, yeah, I'm not really much of a brainstormer. Do you know what I mean? I'm not kind of like, uh, sit down today and come up with 10 ideas for movies. Right. Not really it, you know, it, I think it's more just sort of, you know, listening to what the universe tells you and that kind of thing. And somewhere a few years back, I just went movie about guys called James Bond. That could be interesting. And I tried to see if it existed already and it didn't. And I was like, that's a good idea. I should probably make that before someone else does. Um, and that's kind of how we got to the other fellow, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I definitely think it's such an interesting premise. And the fact that you went in this direction, I think, was probably the thing that intrigued me the most to watch the movie. Now, I did actually do a review for it earlier in this week. I saw the movie a little bit early. I got sent a early screener. And I loved your film, man, genuinely. I have a rule for myself when it comes to interviewing people on the channel that even if it's somebody who I've enjoyed their other works, if I'm interviewing them for a certain project, I won't interview them unless I enjoyed the film. And uh, I'm really happy to say, man, I loved the film. I thought it was really, really great. Definitely a documentary that stands out. Um, and so, yeah, you know, what really, really at its core gave you the the idea, the the, the chase to go after a documentary about all these different people named James Bond? Well, I was at kind of in the, during the early days when Facebook first came out and there was a real novelty to like those Facebook groups and there were all these like weird faces. I was a member of a Facebook group for 
people who use their cell phone as a flashlight, you know, just these dumb Facebook groups. And I ended up becoming a member of one for everyone else who was called Matthew Bauer. And it was called Embassy, almost like a like a bad nightclub night. You know what I mean? Like M B A S Y. It was like the Matthew Bowyer Appreciation Society, which was a joke, obviously. But we would talk about the really innocuous, boring stuff. So you know when you go and try and sign up for like Anthony Perez at gmail.com and it's already taken, and you go, Oh, there must be another Anthony Perez out there who's already taken this address. And so we would talk about things like, you know, who's got Matt Bauer at Gmail, who's got Matthew Bauer at at Gmail, who's got the Matt Bauer Instagram handle, like that kind of thing. And I think somewhere in there came the idea of like, what, what, what if that, but for James Bond, because, you know, even things like the email address thing, you'd never be able to get James Bond at Gmail, kind of all that kind of thing. And so, I jumped on Facebook to look for James Bonds um, and jumped on Google to look for James Bonds. And if you've seen the film, you'll see how relevant that initial search actually was. Right. Um, And the thing was, I couldn't find them. They they were hard to find. You couldn't find them on Google because all you got was James Bond stuff. Um, And on Facebook, all of my characters, they're all Bond James or JB Bond or something like that. And... The reason I figured out why and they explained to me is you can't sign up for Facebook as James Bond. It flags you for, for using a false name. And it actually oh, yeah. says to you, are you trying to create a fan page for James Bond 007? So it gives you the option to make a James Bond fan page, but you can't sign up with your own name. So even That's on crazy. Facebook, they would all have to assume a false kind of identity to be able to use it. Um and, and so even from the start, especially in the area of online identity, I was like, there's kind of something here that can kind of work in a, as a bit of a techno thriller, if you know what I mean, which kind of under the hood of this quite funny film, th- that's kind of what's driving the plot a lot of the time. Um, yeah. And then uh, aside from that, w- when I wrote to them, they wrote back with stuff that if you've seen the film, you'll know was far deeper than than aston martin jokes uh you know they were talking about being on the run from the police being on the run from stalkers um real proper cases of uh, identity theft and kind of identity confusion and you know being being confused for you know one of the stories in the film is about a man who gets confused for another man named james bond who's accused of murder Uh, and that kind of complication I was kind of like, you can build film a- a- around that. Um, you know, and I think with this film, it, you know, we, we played it here in California last night and the film plays really well as a comedy, but me and my editor, Leslie, we didn't, we didn't have that many conversations about comedy. It was always conversations more about what is the clockwork precise structuring of this that you do that kind of very much did come from thrillers as opposed to like a comedy sort of structure to it. Um, so yeah, even though there are a lot of jokes, there throwaway is not quite the right word, but the material itself is funny. We were never working that hard on the comedy stuff. Right. Yeah. And I was going to say, like, I think that that was part of the intrigue of the movie for me was that, at first, it just seemed like this silly, fun idea. And that's why I was like, yeah, I definitely want to watch it. Uh, I watched it with my with my wife and we both sat down and we were both just into this premise right out of yeah. the gate. We had we had a laugh before the title card even played just because of how bizarre some of this stuff was. Yeah. But then we found ourselves like really gripped and like consistently like having moments of like, wow, that's crazy. Like didn't even think about the fact that, you know, what is the likelihood that two guys that have the same name as James Bond within a sh- small window of space, one of them yeah. would end up being like literally have the police coming after them for, for murder, as you mentioned. And now the other ones got to kind of deal with the repercussions of that, like the likelihood of that. It's crazy. And of course, when it comes to directing, I know you directed some short films when it comes to directing um, scripted things, you know, you can go in with a vision. And if you execute on that vision, you kind of, you know, you know where it's going to go. Whereas with documentaries, you know, even though you do have certain things to work with, you got to hope that the conversations and things they're telling you can build a story. So what kind of complications did you find in terms of formulating the the movie and building? I believe your, your editor's name is Leslie Pazzo, right? 
which I thought she did a fantastic job with the with the direct with the editing. And uh, the two of you guys clearly worked together to have a vision for this movie. How did you bring all those pieces together and all this conversation and, and you know yeah. all together and make this movie? Yeah, I mean, I mean, she did an amazing job for the film. I mean, when you watch the film, it feels effortless. Right. Uh, took years to get right because you'll see in the film there are actually about 15 James Bonds and some of them only appear for for five seconds um and that was kind of a thing we did kind of film and did full interviews with all of them and there were earlier cuts where kind of it was almost like everyone was getting their three minutes and we were trying to intercut maybe too much actually between the stories and she came in and kind of said let's isolate your five main characters here and really treat them as the leads in this film and then kind of use the other bonds as like a chorus of experts who kind of weigh in b b between the stories um you know and if, if you were watching a documentary about a more standard subject you know climate change or something there would be those experts who get called in for a line on, on the topic every now and then um, and we sort of used our characters as those. Um, but yeah, isolating those kind of really main characters was kind of the big thing. And the big thing for us was that we looked at a lot of those kind of like fan documentaries. You know how you have kind of um, like the People versus George Lucas about the Star Wars fans when Phantom Menace was released would be a good example. There's, there's not right. coming about um, Doctor Who fans and that kind of thing. And those kind of films often has have like scenes shot at like Comic-Con and, and that kind of thing. And you get in a lot of music documentaries as well, where it's like all the subjects sit back in a chair and they reflect on an incident that happened years ago and, and have a bit of a laugh. And we didn't want to make that. We, we wanted to have characters who were extremely active. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Like, I kind of say, like, this film is kind of a film a bit like The People versus George Lucas. If right. the subjects were on the run from the police and being, like, imprisoned in various ways throughout the film. And so, you know, in Sweden, we have, you know, the son of a Nazi and we follow his journey, literally turning himself into james bond um with the new york james bond for me it was kind of all about you know he's living in the film under the kind of noise of the release of specter and that causes his phone to ring because people out there in like the media community try and find him to get him to star in commercials and then us following him actually going through on set and kind of filming that commercial obviously with the murder storyline there's a whole on the run from the police trial kind of to it. Um, and then in the kind of fourth storyline, which we kind of keep rather top secret, um, there, there is an extremely dramatic turn of events that, that that's taking place um, kind of in there. And so, yeah, that, that was our main thing to have characters who were like active, who were doing things, who, who wanted things. Um, that you could have a version of this film where it's just a bunch of dudes sitting back being like, ah, you know, you know what I mean? Like, oh, those James Bond films, you know, and then everyone has a bit of a laugh. Um, right. We weren't really interested in that kind of making that kind of like, you know, like fan documentary is sort right. of what we're avoiding. Um, yeah, we, we wanted something which was much more, you know, even with the title, The Other Fellow, it's a, it's a James Bond reference that's quite specific, but... If you don't get the reference, it's meant to kind of sound just kind of like almost like a Hitchcock title, you know, like the wrong man or something. And kind of we, we wanted it to be able to kind of stand on its own as its own kind of, you know, documentary thriller kind of thing. No, not right. feel like something it, it shouldn't. It, we didn't want it to feel like a DVD extra. Um yeah, sorry, it's a very long answer to that question. That's no, I, lo I love, I love long-winded responses, to be honest. But um, yeah, no, I love that. I think the title is incredibly clever. And I think you nailed it when it comes to the unique element of this film. You know, like there are a lot of documentaries that can be super informative, but ultimately can be a little bit dull because there's not much to it other than just people sitting around talking. And one of yeah. the things that I actually loved about your film is that in between these crazy stories we're hearing about people's lives, you were able to actually intercut some um, reenactments over the course of the film. So as a director, how was that approaching that side of it while also having to, you know, 
keep it true to the the stuff that you're hearing from these people? Did you enjoy the documentary side of things more yeah. or the scripted stuff that was a little bit more traditional? Yeah, I, I think for me, uh, you know, I never planned on doing documentary. It was just th this idea obviously called for documentary. But it, it came about reasonably organically. What, what we found was in a lot of our main stories, the characters were talking about a time of their lives, which was a very dramatic, but b un undocumented, uh, you, you know, and especially in the two more dramatic sequences of the film. Also in Sweden, there's a whole part of the story that took place in the Second World War. And we did try in our early edits, just just using like photographs, you, you know, and kind of a more relaxed kind of thing. And it just didn't work. And, and this film was kind of asking for that sort of reenactment -y kind of thing. But reenactments can be really bad. And we didn't want to do, we didn't want reenactments that were just like, you know, a, a cigarette butt burning, you, you know, or, or these kind of very small inserts um, or, yeah, we, we wanted to film them not so much like they were from a James Bond movie, but like they were from a movie. Right. Um, and also, I mean, because, y you know, this film is, it's related to James Bond, you know, and I think you, the audience kind of expects a certain level of like production value. I think when they go into something kind of Bond related, again, we didn't want to seem like some cheap knockoff fan doc. Right. Um, and so the sequences that required reenactments primarily were um, the World War II sequence, the, the whole like police arrest sequence. Um, and especially for those, they really allowed us to get like police helicopters I I into the film, you know, and actually in the World War II, there's a whole like, 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 missile raid kind of thing going on um and let us get in like those rate those you know world war ii radar plots and that kind of thing and just visually it allowed a lot of that stuff um in into the film you know and it's kind of weird with them some of them in, in some of the reenactments the characters are actually playing themselves um and then in some others it was using kind of actors to sort of cover them um and just find a way we mo a lot of stuff you do for reenactment you kind of get it in the edit and it doesn't quite work for one reason or another reenactment. It's very delicate, you know, getting it to kind of work properly and also not overdoing it with re the problem when you go into reenactment, especially as a filmmaker is you get really tempted to film an entire 10 minute James Bond sequence. You know, we, we did find in the end of the edit cutting back to their interview actually as much as possible rather than making it like a live action scene with a narration kind of work best. Um, right. Yeah. In the end. Yeah. I think, I think you handled it really well. It kept it engaging to watch. You know, I was, in, I was gripped by people's stories while also being able to see these reenactments. And it was cool because, you know, you mentioned there's a, there's a portion that takes place in world war two and like to see like the fact that you go from this documentary to an element now where you have like special effects and all this stuff going on. It's like, oh, okay, this is like, a like, like you said, it's not like a knockoff documentary that you kind of just find online on YouTube somewhere. Like this is like a real film that has a, a nice yeah. production value behind it. I felt like it was crisp and clean throughout. And so, yeah, I got I to gotta commend you guys yeah. for that. And obviously your editor, uh, Leslie, was a huge part of, of making that flow really well. And obviously you had a vision. Um, so I guess my question is now, like, what's, what's the biggest takeaway you hope people have from this film now that it's been released? You know, what, what, what are you hoping uh, to, to hear from people and see from people? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I kind of have two answers to that. I can give you the official answer, right? And the more official sounding answer would be, um, you know, you you do learn a lot about like identity from this film, you know, like male identity, sexual identity, racial um, identity, and 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 what I've learned from the film is what I didn't kind of know going in is just just how much like just your name is an important thing you know and we, we focus a lot these days about how we judge people for the, you know their skin color for 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 their for, for their weight uh you know for for their disability or ability and kind of those kind of things but this thing that we hand off to people you know hi I'm Matthew Bauer I'm Anthony Perez at the start of most social interactions, we don't really think so much about, you know what I think, I don't know how to put it. I think immigrants have to deal with this 
a, a lot more. You, you know, I mean, people who move to, to a new country and they've got a very kind of different name, I think they come across that sort of thing a lot more. Um, so there is that kind of side of thing. The, the more unofficial answer is actually in the editing room. Me and my editor were never having a conversation about, oh, my God, this is going to teach me people something about or oh, what, what, what <laughs> thing about identity will people learn here and to a degree i don't really care i mean as a filmmaker i i uh, w what i hope people get out of this film it is a really good time at the cinema in the way that you would get from like a hitchcock film uh you know that's what really does it for me and you know when i go back to the usual suspects thing that there is one moment in the film, which actually, funnily enough, does also take place kind of in an interview room at a police station that is designed to make you do that thing where you lean forward in your chair and go, oh, shit, oh, uh, okay. I, and, you know, it's a moment where kind of everything in the film up to that point suddenly distills into one choice and one decision. And, you know, when that moment happened, in the theater where we played the film last night, like you could hear that in the audience, you know, and people were like, people started clapping when they kind of realized what was going on. And as a filmmaker, that's me going, yes, that that's, that's the kind of job done here, you know? And so, yes, I hope people learn things about identity and that kind of thing that, that that's great. But I also hope that it, grabs them and does the things to them that we were hoping in the editing room, you know, that it would. Right. For sure. That, that emotional connection with the movie. And I, I can tell you from my personal experience that my wife and I definitely had that. So that's, uh, I'm hoping that the same for you. And I'm glad to hear that it had a really good response last night at the theater that you saw it at. I guess moving forward, my question is now, are you thinking you're going to dive deeper into some more documentaries as time goes on? Or do you think after this experience, you've kind of had your, your fill with documentaries for right now? No, I, I weirdly, I think once you own a documentary, I can't really imagine doing something entirely fictional now. Um, you know, I, I, I can imagine doing something like based on a true story. You know, I get that. But coming up with something from scratch and just sitting down, you know, with a paper and being like, you know, interior apartment day. <laughs> John walks in. Is your, Hello, John. Hello. I, I just kind of can't really imagine that. Um, yeah, so I think I'm kind of staying in this sort of documentary based on a true story um, sort of area. And I, I, I just, I, I find working with the real world kind of kind of more interesting and kind of that way of like m making a film out of real people's stories and that sort of thing. I think I've really kind of got into, um, yeah, yeah, through this process. And you also have on a more, on a practical level, you know, like you've, when you make a documentary, you kind of meet a lot of people in the documentary space. You kind of meet companies who buy documentaries and that kind of thing. And you sort of learn the kind of funnel for this sort of area. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the, uh, this film took a long time to make, you know, and I think hopefully, you know, kind of with some of the connections we've made making this yada yada, uh, I think the next one should be somewhat faster. That's great, man. Yeah. And I think like you mentioned, it's like there's a whole challenge that comes with making a scripted film. But there's, you know, as you just mentioned, it took a long time to make this film. What was the pre-production like for this film in terms of all the, the the different research that had to go into place and all the different people you had to reach out to? Did you have James Bonds that maybe you reached out to that said no to being in the film? You know, what was that pre-production process like? Yeah. I'll tell you, if I could do pre-production again, I would have spent probably two more years in pre-production and, and not started filming as early as we did. Um, we kind of, we kind of found out James Bonds and, and kind of got going. You'll see in the film, there's, there's a, there's an 88 year old James Bond who goes skydiving for his birthday right. and the research process. They said, Oh, he's going skydiving in like two months time in Texas. And we were like, well, we've got to get the 88 year old James Bond skydiving. But that kind of had a way. And then obviously because we were flying to America to film that, it was like, well, while we're there, we'll film these other guys we've been speaking to, yada, yada. But I I, I think actually we might have been better served early on spending more time so, sort of in pre-production. Um, and there's a few things I'll do differently. We, we actually shot all of our interviews where the Bonds live, you know. So when you're seeing an interview with the guy in Indiana, we're actually in Indiana. If I could do for my next film, I would actually fly everyone to London where we're based 
and put them in a hotel room for the night. Even though that seems more expensive, it's actually cheaper in the end than bringing a whole crew, uh, you, you know, kind of somewhere. And so, yeah, the, the, the pre-production on this was, we got there in the end, but as my first film, I, I think I, I didn't quite know enough kind of when to shoot and when not. Uh, to shoot uh yeah and I think we th there is a lot on the cutting room floor with with this I I think it is better I think to kind of film all your interviews first probably cut them together into something like a rough cut and then go okay what footage do we now need to kind of fill in the gaps here um you'll see there's a sequence in like Guyana in South America which as we were filming, we were like really, really excited about, you know, like, oh, we're filming in South America, you know, yada, yada. And actually the Guiana section is only in the film for like kind of 45 seconds, uh, yeah. you know, something like that in the end, um, you know, and, and in the end of that, it, it, we, how do I put it? We didn't really need to spend $2,000 flying to Guyana to get, to, to kind of get where we could have flown him to us and save some money, yada, yada. So this is more boring technical stuff behind the scenes um but yes yeah yeah the i i, I think for my next film yeah probably longer in pre-production and less time shooting gotcha well you definitely don't think it's uh, any sort of boring tidbits i think that's kind of the fun of the behind the scenes experience i'm sure for you yeah. tedious money spending for people like myself who just love that kind of stuff i just love hearing about the process and what you maybe learned from it and what works what didn't work and i guess i have to ask as a big cinephile myself the film came out today in theaters limited release as well as on vod is there any plan for a blu-ray release over the course of time for physical media collectors i'm sure there will be james bond fans who will come across yeah. this film and want to add it to their collection yeah well i can announce you it actually is now out on blu-ray uh and oh DVD. nice so same day oh. okay cool it's up there on Amazon uh, kind of now. If, if you want to kind of know a bit about behind the scenes of filmmaking kind of stuff is that our distributor kind of really asks us, and I do get why, they really like to push like the Apple the, the, the Apple TV kind of links because it has, right. put it, you know, when you have like, say like the Rotten Tomatoes top 10 streaming films, as far as I understand, they get a lot of data from like iTunes charts Gotcha. Uh, and kind of that kind of thing. So for us in the lead up to this, we've been really kind of pushing those kind of sales. But actually at midnight last night, it did actually come out kind of on it's it's on like YouTube now and Vimeo and Vudu. It's on Amazon Prime. Um, and you, yeah, you can also now get the DVD uh, on DVD and Blu-ray. Um, yes, if people want to own it at home. I actually haven't seen the Blu-ray myself yet, but I'm looking forward to getting my hands on one. So that's pretty exciting. Is there any behind the scenes footage or anything like that that's not in the movie that's on that Blu-ray? No, maybe for a special edition somewhere in the future. I think uh, uh, you have all these dreams, don't you? Of like, oh, when my film comes out on Blu-ray, I'll have all these special features and kind of right. all this. I think in independent cinema, by the time you get to release, you are a somewhat bankrupt and tired individual, uh, you, you know, and it, it, during a release of a film like we've been doing here, I, uh, you don't, uh, at least on our end, we wouldn't have had the manpower, resources or energy to add a whole new facet to what we were doing. And there wasn't right. space for let's let's do another two weeks or a month of production making sort of special you know features but definitely down the line um yeah well, something we've wanted to do with this is maybe a few kind of shorts called the other fellows which is kind of taking some of the guys who are in our film who maybe are only in it for 30 seconds or so um and kind of expanding their stories out um that sort of thing but i think i think for a lot of filmmakers that's why you do kind of have the special edition somewhere down the line um because yeah there just isn't that space and time for like you know what i mean Let, let's right. do special it's a miracle that you've got a film done in the first place Anthony. <laughs> there's often not it. yeah yeah there's there's once you've crossed that finish line of someone's like hey do you want to make another 10 special features it's like no no not today uh, that's pretty awesome, though, man. I love hearing about that process and e even hearing that, you know, it's like a, we were like down to the wire with certain things. I think that's kind of like the fun of the stories. You know, you're going to look back at this time frame and just think, wow, like when I made that feature length film, that first one, it's it's crazy how far you've come. 
Well, dude, I don't want to take too much more of your, what you're doing. Sorry. Dream, yeah, yeah, I was saying you always dream. You dream of that point when you're finishing your first film. Do you know what I mean? You're like, oh, we're going to be in the color grade. It's going to be awesome. Most of the final part of at least the process on this, and I think for a lot of filmmakers, is actually just dealing with subtitles and text in a way. So, you know, in this film, right. we've got all of like, you know, it says, you know, James Bond ornithologist. You've got these things coming across on the screen. And then be, what was hard for us is because this film is one quarter in Swedish, the film is subtitled at certain points, but not at others. And that's actually really difficult. It would be easier if the whole film was foreign language, because every time someone spoke, you would know there's a subtitle. Um, but yeah, you, you dream of finishing your first film and that kind of thing. Actually, most of the final parts of the process where you're up till five in the morning, you with your color grader pulling your hair out is because the especially in this film all of the swedish sections are kind of in the snow and the subtitles are white so you have to get the drop shadow just right 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 <laughs> on every one and it's like honestly the very last things we were doing for a week on this film was was drop shadows <laughs> 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 it's like it, it's like yeah those things. there's a point with about five minutes left to go in the film when there's no more title cards and there's no more subtitles and it's it's when we meet the kid and he's playing football that was always my happy scene because i knew for the rest of the film there was no on-screen text <laughs> and we could chill out you could just kind of like relax on that level yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I, I got the impression you like the, the tedious behind the scenes stories. Oh, I love it, man. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I could sit here and talk to you all day. I, I know that you're a busy man, too, so I don't want to take up too much of your time. But I could sit here and talk about the tedious behind the scenes stuff all day. Um, yeah, yeah I, I guess, you know, is there any final words you want to say on the movie for anybody who hasn't seen it yet? Maybe somebody that needs to be sold on it a little bit more. Yeah. If you haven't been sold on it already, come on, guys, check out the other fellow movies out. It's amazing. Wow. Yeah, I, I would say listen to the reviews of the film, the people who've seen it. I, I think naturally, one thing I do kind of get when people hear this idea is they kind of go, oh, it can't be that bad to be called James Bond. Why would you want to see a whole film about that? And actually, this film isn't really about how bad it is to be called James Bond. You know, it, it is almost a more kind of almost sci-fi take on this very unique situation that happens to these men, you know, who have this name. And I think, uh, <laughs> do, do you know, the general reaction we get for this film is, and I don't know if you agree, but we get when people said they go, that was much better than I was expecting it to be. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we kind of strike like that as well. And, you know, when you see the first 10 minutes of the film, we did want to get in every terrible Aston Martin joke and everything in that right. first, minutes and so when it then does cut to sweden and everyone's speaking swedish and then from there you're suddenly taken to nazi occupied denmark we did want to leave the audience in this place where they're like i have no idea where this film is going and i have no right. idea because we've already had the aston martin and shaken not stirred jokes so where is this thing kind of going and i would say if you've seen it, Anthony, it goes to some places you definitely, definitely can never guess it, it, it will go right. to. Say, I, I, yeah, if you can not read some reviews, which have kind of ruined that. And a, a lot of the reviews, they, they just, they just say the whole plot of the film. So yes, I go into the film and yeah, it, it will take you to some places you don't expect. Yes. For sure. Yeah, I think that, you know, I won't get into any spoilers, of course. But yeah, I think that was part of what I loved about it was that, you know, I went into it originally watching the thing because this is such an interesting premise. And, you know, I'm sure I was ready to hear like the hardships and the struggles and, you know, and then there's kind of the jokes about it that, you know, they somebody comes up to them and they want them to quote lines from James Bond, all that kind of stuff. But what I found so interesting about the film over the course of time was not necessarily, like you said, the bad parts of being James Bond, but just like the insane. Oh, there's a point where you're like the insanity around people's lives, around the fact that their name is James Bond, um, you know, or, or people who have to, you know, utilize the name James Bond yeah. for a very specific reason to, to kind of protect yeah. themselves. It's really interesting to, to see the, the various ways. I think you chose some of the most interesting people. And, and I have to ask, were there, were there any people that, that you asked to be in this that were named James Bond that just didn't want anything to do with it? 
Yeah, I, I mean, definitely in this country, I don't know if you know, but Chicago's most famous projectionist is a man named James Bond. Interesting. Um, you know, he was like Roger Ebert's favorite projectionist. So if you read a lot of Roger Ebert's old articles, he talks about this this James Bond who's famous in the Chicago scene. And I asked him to be in the film. Um, and, and he didn't want to do it. And do you know why I think he didn't want to do it? I think he knows a bit too much about documentary and cinema, you, you know, and I think you really are throwing yourself in a filmmaker's hands, you, you know, and there are a lot of doc, I don't think this film does, but there's a lot of documentaries which kind of do sort of make fun of their subjects, you, you know, and I think that this film really actually takes what they're going through seriously. But I think he was worried about being in a film which kind of made fun of him as a guy called James Bond and as kind of a well-known professional in the cinema industry. Uh, he didn't want to do it. There's another one. Um, there's a company called Undefeated. I don't know if you know. They're like Undefeated, like shoes and clothing, and they're based out of Los Angeles. Right. The guy that runs Undefeated is actually called James Bond. And so he really tries to kind of play it down. He just did a line of shoes a few years back with David Beckham. It was called Beckham X Bond. Um, awesome. so he's a really famous James Bond as well. And again, I, I just got, I, I sent so many emails and tried calling the office and that kind of thing. And he wasn't down. So I think the ones who already had a bit of a public profile and who had managed to succeed in spite of having this name, they didn't want to mess with that. You know what I mean by being right. in the film. Um, yeah, there was another one on the set of The Living Daylights. They were filming in Gibraltar, at, and that's kind of a British army base. And there was a British army officer called James Bond there. And of course, they brought him out to get photos with Timothy Dalton. And it was the moment where, you know, James Bond met James Bond. And so I tracked him down um and i got no response or whatever because they're in england i actually drove to their house and just knocked on the door and his wife was like leave us alone we've got your letters we don't want to know about it and i never actually got to meet him but but she explained it does make sense that a lot of the local media in england has been trying to get him on tv for years because they've found that photograph from behind the scenes of the living daylights and they've gone oh we've got to interview the, you know this guy um, and so I was one of a long list of people who bugged them. And that's why they were just, even though I was trying to make, you know, the ultimate James Bond documentary, um, they didn't want to know about it. So yeah, there were a few who didn't want to know about it, but, but they were kind of ones who already had had a touch of the public eye, if, if that makes sense. Um, whereas definitely the ones in my film were ones who, they were really, they were happy that I was making a movie about this problem they have you know and specifically that i was making a movie you know because they're haunted by these movies um i think they really dug the idea that they got their own film you know right. and I, dug the, I was taking their pro i mean this film takes this film is it's it's ridiculous right i mean if you actually think about this film at any point as you're watching it's like it's like we're watching a a, a black man in prison right on trial for murder, reading out Facebook jokes about James Bond, making fun of, you know, him, you know what I mean? So he's, you know, in right. prison, reading out Facebook comments of, I thought James Bond had a license to kill, commenting on his upcoming murder. And if you ever take a step back, it's ridiculous. But the point was, is we wanted to take it 100% seriously at all times and never wink at the camera and never kind of go, look at these crazy men named James Bond. Um, you know, the, the film takes its subject matter very seriously and it goes all the way through exploring it. Um, and they really respected that, that they really respected that it was like, no, we're going to make this film. We're going to take this seriously. Um, you know, there, there's a version, you, you've seen the sweet in this, the, there's the Swedish James Bond in the film. Right. And he, you would have seen in the film, some of the Swedish media coverage of him and it all makes him a joke. You know what I mean? Like the, the, the crazy man, it's the crazy man, everybody. And like, we didn't right. want to do that at, at, at all. We wanted to take it kind of very seriously. And I actually think through taking it seriously, the film is actually kind of funnier. In the, the joke of the film, many of the funny parts is how seriously we're taking it and how much we're not going, you know, I, I don't like zany. Anthony, do you know what I mean? You know, you know what I see it sometimes you get it in documentary where 
the film comments on itself and it goes right it's crazy isn't, isn't this just wild <laughs> do you know what I, mean? I, I was like i never wanted this film to, to, to do that um yes yes sorry i went off tangent there anthony it's very mm -hmm. early in the morning no i i love it man i love it dude it's just uh yeah you know i think that the the serious take on it the honesty is what made it funny at times right because it wasn't you trying to be like look at this insane thing you know i, I thought it was interesting right when you mentioned the, the swedish guy that there were the people in the town that kind of like viewed him as a bit of a, a nutcase but then when you really honed in on him it was just this guy and he you just kind of the honesty behind his reasoning for living his life the way he does is part of what makes certain things funny but also keeps you really engaged throughout yeah. so i think that your your approach was yeah. definitely the way to go about it yeah and i mean he sets the time I mean, he takes it seriously do you know right. what i mean and I mean, he is what he's saying is ridiculous at, at points you know he's like oh I've, I've i lost my father so i turned myself into james bond you know he's like oh i don't want to get married because james bond got married and his wife was murdered so i i don't, I don't want to put my girlfriend at risk right so, right it's completely ridiculous but but he says it with with a with the straightest of faces you, you know and i think the film adopted the same stance if that makes sense Right. No. Yeah. I, I, I love that, man. I think that then the honesty of everybody, the honesty uh, from you as a filmmaker and the way that you portrayed it all, I think is what made all of it really work. I got to ask you, um, I guess one of, one of the final questions I'll ask you, because I know you got a, a busy day, I'm sure. Um, what, what, what was, what's your favorite James Bond film? Is there a favorite James Bond for you? Yeah, I, I think for me, what I was so funny about the Bond films is I, I always like the outliers if you know what I mean, like you have to have your standard bog standard Bond films, you know, something like Tomorrow Never Dies, right? You know, to kind of establish what a Bond film is. But the ones you always remember are the ones that kind of break the mold a, a little bit, you know. And I always say Goldfinger, I always find since we're in America, Goldfinger, I always find kind of amazing because you know, when you think of Bond, you think of the Bahamas. And, and you know what I mean? And, and, you know, these kind of very Bond locations. Goldfinger is the most famous Bond film, and most of it takes place on a horse farm in Kentucky. It's not, when you think of James Bond, you don't think of, like, Kentucky, USA, right? Right. And I think kind of in the same way, you know, like, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, I love because it's, it's kind of this different sort of Bond film. Um, License to Kill, I, I just love. Um, Goldeneye, I, th I think it's just amazing. Um, yeah, yeah, they're probably my sort of top ones. Skyfall as well, you know, it is is a great film, which again is very not like your kind of normal Bond film. And then my favorite James Bond is Roger Moore. Um, nice. but I don't think any of his films are quite... Roger Moore, I like his consistency. I think every Roger Moore film is a really good three and a half out of four star you know film and if ever i want just like a guaranteed good bond film it's like always roger moore um but yeah yeah i i, I think it, there's always an appeal especially like the bond films that are by a different you, you know everyone's like oh john barry the famous john barry music and he's great but kind of because of that you know it's really cool when you have a different composer on a bond film you know like michael Kamen's score for license to kill it's so cool because something it's like a James Bond movie that sounds like the Lethal Weapon soundtrack, you, you know, and stuff like that. I, as a filmmaker, I find kind of really interesting. Um, but yes, but sorry, I could go on about Bond forever, Anthony, but I've got to run. No, uh, no worries, my friend. Well, thank you so much for taking the time, uh, Matthew. Really appreciate it. Everybody, the other fellow is now available. Go give us some love. Check it out. Drop your reviews online so Matthew and the team can see because, uh, yeah, it's definitely a great film. And any final words on your end, my friend? No, Phil, well, just thank you very much for having me on. And yeah, thank you for your for your review. Um, yeah, it was much appreciated. It's always helpful getting the word out there. Absolutely. Well, I hope the film does well. I hope it has a nice success, my friend. And uh, to anybody watching live, thanks for watching. Thanks for your comments. And uh, for anybody who's watching this after the fact, uh, yeah, definitely go check out the movie. Uh, all right, guys. We'll see you guys next time. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. Catch you later.